I've got diphtheria crushing my esophagus. I've got Ebola virus dripping from my nose. I've got the leprosy of the heart bone, exacerbating my incredible woes. I want to take my brain out and blast it with the wave, an ultrasonic, echographic, and a pulsating shave. I want a magic pill for all my ailments, the health equivalent of Citizen Kane. And if I don't get it now in the tablet, I think I'm doomed and I'll have to go insane. I want a requiem for my disease. It's Weird Medicine, the first and still only uncensored medical show in the history of broadcast radio, now a podcast. I'm Dr. Steve with my little pal, my wife, Tacey. Hello, Tacey. Hello. Um, this is a show for people who would never listen to a medical show on the radio or the Internet. If you've got a question you'd like to uh, answer it on the air, you're too embarrassed to take it to your regular medical provider. Tough shit. Go somewhere. <laughs> yep. See you later. Give us a call at 347-766-4323. That's 347-POOHEAD. Visit our website at drsteve.com for podcasts, medical news, and stuff you can buy. Most importantly, we are not your medical providers. Take everything here with a grain of salt. Don't act on anything here on the show without talking over with your doctor, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, pharmacist, chiropractor, acupuncturist, yoga master, physical therapist, clinical laboratory scientist, registered dietitian, or whatever. All right. Very good. Um, we're going to from now on work through the plugs a lot quicker than we normally did because we've now got ads now that we've moved over to this new platform there's ads before the show ads in the middle of the show and ads at the end are these money making ads they are um oh <laughs> so so uh i don't want people to be too inundated with ads please check out our sponsors we appreciate that i'm going to um uh Direct you to stuff.drsteve.com for all your Amazon needs and any things that you're interested in uh, in uh, uh, getting from Amazon or things that we talk about on this show. And if you're interested in getting a thumb drive fr- from our show uh, that has all the shows up till now on it, it's 30 bucks. It's a 32 gig hard drive or uh, thumb drive. And right now you can get a Weird Medicine Corona m- mask. That is not guaranteed to do anything but look cool. Uh, with no. your purchase of thirty dollars, and you go to uh, drsteve.com in the middle of the page, you'll see in red. Uh, click here to get a thumb drive with every show on it. It is not guaranteed to look cool. It looks cool as hell. It does not. It's cool as hell. It's terrible. But you should get one. <laughs> You're terrible. Well. All right, very good. Hey, Tace, um, yep. don't forget uh, Dr. Scott's website. It's simplyherbals.net. Someday Dr. Scott will return. I don't know when that's going to possibly be, but uh, uh, hopefully soon. He's working on rearranging his schedule, he told me. Oh, is he? Okay, yes. good. All right, good. well, good for him. Um, all right, uh, we have a guest today, and uh, this is a very interesting guest. We've been talking about vaccines, and we have some vaccine news that we're going to talk about later today. We are recording this on uh, Wednesday, August 12th, in case this gets replay. And now we sound stupid because the vaccine caused I Am Legend. But right now uh, we have with us Michael. Michael, who's a Weird Medicine listener, and uh, he is a uh, recipient of an experimental vaccine. So, Michael, thanks for joining the show. No problem. Um, before I go into that, I, I want to point something. I think this takes this is worth a minute, Dr. Steve. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We had, we had a little bit of a problem setting this up. In fact, uh, the first uh, time you had set the date and time and then you didn't show. And then you had emailed <laughs> me a few hours later and you said, are you free now? And I said four minutes later. I was free, and I gave my phone number again, and then two hours later, you said, oh, I just got this. And <laughs> was at the-, the time that you emailed me back and said, are you free now, and I promptly responded, <laughs> you were also tweeting at the same time <laughs> when you called me, and I want, do you remember what you were tweeting? No, I have no idea. All right. Well, you were actually retweeting with a comment, a question, so you were helping someone medically. Mm-hmm. The person had reached out to you for help, and they had reached out simply by saying, at Weird Medicine, Weird Medicine, Chunky Cum. Any comments? And uh, well, that, you gave that way more important than talking to you. Of, yep, uh, coagulated <laughs> semen will go in and advised him to clean his pipes maybe a little more often. That's but right. that's what I got bumped for. That's what I did instead. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, while you were off doing that. Well, at so least get one thing. Let's out. get one thing straight. It's semen gelin. That's how it's <laughs> properly pronounced. So anyway. But anyway. Yeah, um, I'm yeah, sorry so. about that. Yeah, it's... I'm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
uh, honestly, I've not been as good as staying on my schedule, and that's just because our schedules are so screwed up. I mean, you know, for uh, for five months, my kids were just sitting here at home. We had no schedule going on. I was taking uh, doing um, office visits fr- from my house. Uh, through telemedicine, which was really a treat, uh, doing 15 minutes to 20 minutes of, um, of uh, uh, you know, of tech support with, you know, little old ladies up in the mountains of Virginia going, well, honey, I don't know if I got a tablet. Am I supposed to swallow it? You know, so it was, uh, you know, yeah, it's not been a good, my most shining moment as far as being organized. So I apologize. For that. I'm up practicing attorney. I'm home right now in the middle of the day working from home. We have a lot of court appearances from home and it is very difficult to even remember what day it is. Yeah. I um, did I did a court appearance from home. I I got uh pulled before COVID-19 happened and my court date happened to be right in, you know, the middle of the lockdown and so it was fun going to court are you via in Zoom. Hmm? Are you in trouble? No, 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 no. Bit. Well, it's so so I I guess I can tell this story now. Uh I well, I get to court and the judge is my best friend's nephew. He's also an attorney, but it's his nephew and I took him to Ozfest like when he was 16 and when he was 17, he had a party at his house and he couldn't get all the people that showed up that weren't supposed to be there at his house. And I went over and, you know, with with his uncle and said, hey, the cops are coming, you know, to get everybody out of there. And then here's this, you know, this guy is my judge. And he said, well, you know, do you want to plead guilty and get um, uh, driving school? I said, do I have a choice? You know, and he just kind of laughed. He said, well, you I mean, you can go to court if you want to. But, uh, you know, I so I got absolutely no. uh uh, no consideration from him, given that you know, I saved his ass a couple of times. But anyway, usually, they usually err on the side of oh, trying to. Of course, be, you know. So yeah, but all anyway, right. well, vaccine, so, right? Yeah, it was all through Zoom. So yeah, so tell us how you got into this vaccine. So you're in a clinical trial, is that right? I am. I'm in Do the you... Moderna uh, clinical trial of their mRNA vaccine. And this and, is phase um, three or phase two now? I'm a phase three candidate. Okay, so um, let's explain to everybody. Phase three is when you give it to thousands and thousands of people. What you're trying to do is tease out any very small effects. Uh, so if you have if you have a uh, an adverse effect that only affects one in ten thousand people, testing three hundred people isn't going to show that most of the time. So now they're looking at doing you know thirty thousand or more patients. Or do you yeah, know the number? Do you know and the number? I think also uh, for efficacy, you need this many people out there uh, in hot and outbreak times right now to get this data as fast as you can. Since you're not doing challenge trials where you give, like they could have given Michael the vaccine and then a week later come in and uh, sprayed uh, SARS-CoV-2 up his nose. He's absolutely right. When you've got a penetrance at the worst of times, you know, if you're on a uh, cruise ship of only 17 percent, it only penetrated the Diamond Princess 17 percent, you're going to have to treat thousands and thousands of people to to see that also small effect of preventing people from getting the disease or preventing them from from going uh, to the hospital if they do get it or preventing them from dying if they do go to the hospital. So anyway, you're right on all accounts. So in the very beginning, so I also own a business that I have a factory partner in China. And so I've been kind of following this from the get go because we were affected over there. And then right as that was kind of getting resolved, we started having the lockdowns and outbreaks here. So I started kind of obsessing with COVID stuff, COVID data, uh, emailing Dr. Steve random stuff. Oh, did you really? uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, which one of the early things I emailed you was uh, speculation of a coronavirus crossover type of immunity type thing. And this was probably in the end of March. And that looks to be starting to flush out a little. So I took, um, I was taking an interest, but I've never taken a flu vaccine. I don't really get sick very often. I'm a 40 year old male. uh, And uh, so I didn't wasn't really afraid of it, but in the interest of curiosity and, and you know, I was following the vaccine development, I knew what uh, they were doing in vaccines. Uh, so then one day I'm on Twitter and there was an update from a local news source that kind of had a daily COVID update. And then in the headline, it said vaccine trial or local or something like that. Oh, okay. So I read it. And at the end, they said they were going to be doing a vaccine trial here and it had a contact information. I emailed the contact and the doctor who's running the study emailed me and called me the same night. This was probably 
They started in uh, end of July. Uh, this was maybe a month prior. She said, we haven't started yet, but we're getting names. Okay. So then a few weeks prior to that, um, they called me to schedule. So um, they set up the appointment. Uh, and uh, initially, on the very first contact, that ver first day, she sent me an email with the consent form in it, just a generic consent. And okay. at that point, I knew it was the Moderna vaccine. So I right. didn't know initially what it was. Did you have to sign an NDI at the same time? I mean, no. NDA, I mean. Um, the, the agreement discusses confidentiality, and it basically says you are free to talk to people about it. They don't really, it discourages, like, you know, public news things, but, um, okay. you know, it doesn't out, out, out prohibit it, and there's no um, okay. confidentiality agreement. Um, so then they have, I have the appointment. I go in, and they basically do, like, a light physical, kind of poke around on you, uh, check your vitals. Um, and then they take some blood, and then they do a COVID test, the, the very uncomfortable uh, nasopharyngeal test, and right. then uh, and then they do the injection. And so the injection, I mean, I don't know what I got. Uh, definitely something went in. I felt something going in. And then uh, 30 minutes to observe you after. So you sit there for 30 minutes. At the same time, they're setting you up with this e-diary system, and it's a system that they basically um, – that first, you know, week or so thereafter of each injection, they really want to know what's going on. And so the e-diary is an app on your phone. And that first week, you're getting prompts two, three times a day that basically have a series of questions. Okay. They give you a thermometer. They give you a, a, a little tape measure. So if you do have any redness or anything around it, they would want you to measure it. Um, so this is all kind of built in. And they give you a schedule that's for two years. And the two-year schedule has these e-diary uh, commitments in it, and it has seven visits that you have to go over two years. Uh, and uh, the, obviously the first couple are for obvious reasons, and then they, the later ones are likely for continued blood testing and things like that. So um, today I'm 15 days out. At, so at the time, no no side effects at all, no redness. I actually expected, I usually do get redness and in, uh, injections and, and a little bit of pain. They gave it to me in the muscle on the upper, upper arm uh, and uh, no redness, no swelling, nothing, uh, not at the time and not after, no okay. side effects, anything. I've had nothing. Okay, so I'm looking at their structure. It says trial volunteers will receive two intramuscular injections 28 days apart. Participants will be randomly assigned one-to-one -to, -one to receive either two 100 microgram injections of mRNA-1273 or two shots of a saline placebo. Okay, so it's possible you got the placebo then. The yeah. trial is blinded, so the investigators and the participants will not know who is assigned to which group. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And then, uh, so you can't go running around going, hoo, hoo you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm immune. No, you don't know. Um, and like I said, I, I wasn't. I'm not particularly worried about it. it, it um, this was more of an experiment for me. In fact, I, I emailed you an, uh, an article Bloomberg uh, did yesterday about Moderna and the mRNA vaccines and the history, and it, it's really, really uh, interesting. Uh, and I think you should put it in the uh, if this goes on YouTube, put it in the description because it provides okay. a lot of background and on just the last ten years what they've learned, and you kind of realize how little we know when you read this stuff. Yes. Um, and another interesting thing about the vet, so the NIH was saying the other day. Is that you day, or is that me? It's me. Um, Sorry. That's you? Okay. Sorry. Okay, it's okay. The, the NIH was discussing the, uh, last week that in the next month they're going to be putting out a vaccine priority list, and the quote was not everyone is going to like it. But uh, the article had an interesting little uh, fact in it that the, uh, the director said that of the people that uh, would have priority. The people who got the placebo groups in any vaccine would be a priority because, quote, we they, owe them. The, I agree um, with that, 100%. Um, I, I don't even know if I would take it because, I, I, again, I don't care, but I just never really occurred to me that there would be that viewpoint, so it was interesting to see that. Yeah, no, I think that's um, people who have s stood up and uh, taking the risk of uh, helping us get to, uh, you know, advance the science on this, I think they should get it first. So if they decode you and uh, you were in the placebo group, I absolutely would support you getting it first if you wanted it. If you don't want it, that's, that's up to you, but at least offering it to you. Uh, uh, I, I, I wonder I guess, if, 
Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go, sorry. sorry. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, I guess to finish up that process, that thought, then if I have um, any symptoms or think I've been exposed, I'm supposed to contact them. And then they, I would go down there, they would test me. Uh, and then I, what I don't know is, Dr. Steve, if I were in the placebo group, for example, and I tested positive, I wonder if at that point they would just terminate me from the study because uh, I'm kind of useless. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. I, yeah, I think so. I think that your participation in the study would be complete. As far as the science is concerned, they may continue to monitor you for a year, but oh. um, they won't know if you're in the placebo group until they decode it. Now, they will have an independent monitor that's watching this. And if they see a statistically significant difference, if they're still administering doses, if they mm -hmm. see a statistically significant difference that makes giving the placebo now unethical, then they'll stop the trial. But I think the way they're going to do this is just vaccinate a whole bunch of people pretty much, you know, in the same very close time period and then, you know, and then watch them over time. So that won't be what's, an issue. What's your take on this? Because so I read an article yesterday. So this study is supposed to be 30,000. And right now, uh, as of the first two weeks, I guess they had 5,000 enrolled with the okay. expect, expectation that they would have 30,000 by September. Okay. So, so this article was saying that it would be impossible to have a vaccine by election day because it used this September starting point, basically, <laughs> right, for the timelines. Right, right. Not acknowledging you're building thousands up starting in mid-July. What do you think the numbers would have to be? Let's say we have 10,000 people by uh, mid-August out there with this, uh, and, by, and by the 1st of September, they have both doses. And then you have a month in, and let's say out of those 10,000, you had 750 positives, and it's heavily slanted. Let's say it's 90, right. 10, 95, 10. Right. Do you think they move? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, it, it, the thing is, you know, Russia skipped phase three for their vaccine, and we've got a question about it in a minute. I think it is a large phase three in disguise, though, if you kind well, of... That's what it, it is. Uh, you're exactly right. They, they're just giving it to people, and yes, they'll follow them. Uh, so uh, you could look at it that way, but um, the, it's really... Um, you know, been approved for use. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a phase three slash phase four. And if people uh, don't remember these things and they don't listen every week, you know, phase one's where you make sure it doesn't kill people. You give it to 10, 15 people or 40 people. And then phase two, you give it to maybe 300 to see if it seems to work and doesn't kill people. Then phase three is thousands of people up to, you know, 30,000 people. And then phase four is post-marketing. So I what Russia is doing is, you know, basically phase three slash four. I'm just curious what, you know, because uh, Dr. Fauci has said that they would accept the vaccine with the, as low as 50 percent uh, sure. efficacy. So if you got early data that was like, let's say in the 90, where you where you thought, well, this could shake out a little more, but yeah. there's such a gap. I, I just wonder if at that point, if that would just be that's something. That's a policy that question. But yeah, I, I mean, if the science is there, I wouldn't be against it, it particularly if the uh, independent monitor saw that it was uh, highly statistically significant mm -hmm. in favor of, uh, uh, of the vaccine. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I just wonder if we need to explain to people what this Moderna vaccine is because we've been talking about it a little bit on the show. It's fascinating. It's not like any other vaccine that I've ever uh, encountered, although I do understand that the veterinarians use some RNA vaccines. But um, this, um, what, what they were looking at is this spike immunogen. So the spike immunogen is the protein that this, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, uh, virus uses to attach itself to human cells, and it uses this ACE2 receptor. It doesn't really, that's not apropos to this discussion so much. <clears throat> and normally what you would do is you would synthesize that protein and then just inject it into people, and their bodies would make immune responses to it. The problem with doing it that way is you get this huge load of, of um uh, of antigen, and then it just goes away. And it, the, the, one of the hypotheses is, is that that's the reason why you don't get lifelong immunity because it doesn't act like a like a um, an infection because you know an infection starts low and then grows and then the immune system hits it and it takes time and then it shrinks over time and the immune system may actually have a mechanism to sort of see that bell curve and uh, uh, it may help it develop longer lasting immunity. So this. Moderna, their real name is mode RNA. 
you know, their name isn't Moderna. We we call them Moderna now, but they started out as Mode RNA. And their vaccine is actually a piece of messenger RNA, which is instructions to the human cells on how to make the spike protein it's themselves. So you inject the messenger RNA, it inculcates itself into the cells. The mm-hmm. cells' mechanisms then turn around and make this uh, spike immunogen uh, called S2P, and then the body uh, recognizes it as a foreign protein and then mounts an immune response. And when you do it that way, it acts more like a, an actual, like an actual infection, and it may give us better immunity. So it's very interesting. Now you I, I could, like you you could you phone. could spam this this um, uh, um, study, by the way, by going and getting a. Um, Getting uh, antibody, antibody test, yeah. I, I've considered it. Did they tell um, you not to do that? No, no, they. I don't think so. There's a lot of paperwork <laughs> they gave me at the end, and, and uh, I didn't read it all. Lawyers are the worst at reading things. Um, <laughs> Doctors so aren't I any look, better. I look at it like a computer code. Like if the virus is a complete code, and then you, there's this part of that code that kind of tells your body what to do. That that part of that code tells your body how to make the thing to interact with that. Yeah. Well, there's no need to send the whole code in. They're just sending in like a piece of this code. To well, God, you don't want to send thing. the whole code in because <laughs> then yeah. you'd be making viruses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, what's interesting, that's that Bloomberg article, I really recommend it because they this all this technology has really been identified and studied in the last 10 years and uh, really, really much in the last five years. And Moderna and the principles involved in them, they identified these uh, the potential in these mRNA uh, vaccines and the technology to be able to scale up quickly because you're not using live virus. You can right. do things. It's 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 synthetic. They can fabricate it, and they identified that this could be a pandemic solution. Mm-hmm. And they actually came up with a pandemic plan. And then in January, when they learned, Doctor Steve, about this, they activated that plan, and it said that when they saw the China sequence on January 10th. Yep. They met for a week straight. In a week, they identified <laughs> the, the basically the uh, code that yep. they felt would do the trick. That's a amazing. Week. I have to give yeah. them this. It's really amazing. Well, we'll give them one of these, too. Give yourself a bill. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, no, I, I'm very impressed by this. And, yeah, it really is easier to make strands of mRNA than it is to uh, make a bunch of proteins and... Uh, and, and but anyway, this yeah, this is awesome, and uh, yeah, I you know I we hope you're okay and you don't have any adverse <laughs> effects. I really appreciate you. Oh oh, I I I have to go, Mike, because I have to take a call on a guy that's got uh, chunky uh, semen. He call he's calling in. I yeah, know. there's you much more important. <laughs> um, I'll keep you informed, Doctor Steve, and if anything changes, uh, I'll let you know. I'll keep you in the loop. All right. Okay, man. No, that was that was fascinating. Keep please do keep uh, let us know if anything changes. Okay. Or if you hear anything cool. Thanks. Okay. Okay. See you, Mike. All right. Well, there's Mike. How about that? Very interesting. How about that? Cool guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. uh, He was supposed to be on last week, and I just blew it. Oh. What what he doesn't know is I forgot. Oh. (laughs) I forgot to put him on the agenda, and if it's not on the agenda in here, I just don't do it. Okay. And so, uh, and then he's like, hey, I waited around for you. You know, I'm a busy attorney, and... um, I said, well, okay, well, let me just go in the studio right now and record it. And I said, are you busy? Are you free now? Just like he said. He says four minutes. I didn't get that in four minutes. I hung around for a little bit, didn't see him, and then went off and did something else. And then I got back that night and saw him say, yeah, here's my phone number. So we just kind of played tag for a while. But uh, I'm glad that worked out. I did have him on the agenda this time. Very interesting. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. Um, do you you have some things to talk about, right, Tace? Yeah, just a few. Um, I guess this is a good segue into Putin, Putin. and his Mr. new Putin. coronavirus. Yes. And how his daughter got it. Yep. Got the um, not coronavirus coronavirus vaccine, vaccine right. and how his daughter has received it. But um, yeah. Oh, and how it's called Sputnik. Sputnik Five. That's a pretty cool name. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, they were. Uh, it was developed by the Moscow-based. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this in Russian. Gamaleya Institute or Jamalia. I don't know. I, Russian is not one of the languages I know anything about. And uh, they did use some uh, uh, Russian investment money, and they 
they did uh, a bunch of human trials but didn't publish data and didn't even begin the phase three stage, which usually precedes, you know, a- approval until they announced it on Tuesday. And they announced that a phase three trial involving more than 2,000 people in Russia and several Middle Eastern and Latin American countries had begun. And usually they do that in tens of thousands of people. And then um, they, uh, let me see, what did they do? Then they uh, then they went ahead and approved it. They approved the vaccine for public use. So what do we know about it? Um, I don't know much about it. I know that it uses an adenovirus, and I wish that we could get my buddy um, uh, Greg Poland on the phone right now, but we'll get him to, to talk about it. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find anything online about this. They're saying, you know, this is from CNN.com. How did Russia pull this off so quickly? They enacted a law which eliminated the need for phase three vaccine trial before approval. So that was how they pulled it off so quickly. They did phase one and phase two mm-hmm. and then went, OK, it, we're, we're putting this out there. Because Russia was third in the world for a while. It's now fourth. And um, but I can't seem to find how this vaccine works on this article. Nice job, CNN. <laughs> well, nobody really cares about that. I mean, what? No, nah, nobody cares about that. <laughs> but I, I think okay, it's. Okay, well, I care. I think what's what more important living? is yeah, yeah. I think what's more important is. What are you, what are you missing out on if you miss out on phase three? Lots of stuff, right? Yeah, okay, why don't you talk about that? Because you know something about phase three trials. I mean, well, do I? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, you said that with so much conviction that you miss out on lots well, of stuff. You so have to, you otherwise they wouldn't be there. I mean, you miss okay. out on side effects and efficacy yes, and right. all all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Um, I guess you've got nothing to say. About that. <laughs> All right. No, 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 no. I'm like, <laughs> you're funny. Uh, I'm. I was hoping you would talk while I was trying to find some information on what this vi- vaccine is based on. But the yes, you're right. Phase three is there for a reason. It's there to determine overall efficacy, which, as Mike talked about, is hard to do in a virus when you've only got, you know, one percent of your population that's got it. Maybe as high as 15, but some of those are, are a vast majority of those may be asymptomatic. So as far as cases, you're looking at 1% to 2% of the population. So how many do you have to treat before you can prove that 1% to 2% of your, of your test subjects didn't get it? You know, you've got to treat a crap load of people. So um, I am, I, I'm striking out on this. I know that it's based on some adenovirus structure, and that's all I know. So, all right. Uh, we'll find out more for next week. How about that? Because I'm sure this will be in the news for quite some time. Okay. All right. What else you got? Um, 107-year-old New Jersey woman who beat Spanish flu survives COVID-19. So she's 107. So when was she born, Tace? Let me see. Tw- oh, uh, what would that? What? Was... <laughs> uh, t- oh, uh, 1913, right? I, I mean, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. So she was born in. We're, we're well, saying... 1913. Okay, so 1913. I'll do Howard Stern math. Plus seven is 1920. Plus 100 would be 2020. Okay. Right. So yeah. So she was born in 13. So she would have been five when the Spanish flu hit. So she was probably old enough to remember it. My dad survived it too, but he was only two. So that back then, by the way, it was terrifying for parents because the kids were really vulnerable to this one, you know, the the uh, pandemic of 1918. So go ahead. That's scary. So that's all I have to say about that. Well, okay. so she she beat the 1918 pandemic and she is still alive during this one. There's still time for it to get her. Right. Well, it says she survived it. Oh, she had it. Yeah, she had it. Oh, my God. Also, uh, it says that she beat the Spanish flu. So. She so had she that. had it as yeah. well? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Okay, so she's well. Tough. Give yourself a bill. Goodness. Okay. And then bad news for New Zealand. Um, everybody really thought that they had beaten it. Um, yeah. 
They reinstate, reinstate restrictions after first locally transmitted case oh. happens in 102 days. They were so, they had it. Mm-hmm. You know, they were going out, going to movies and going to concerts and congregating because they had beaten it. So some dumbass <laughs> brought mm-hmm. it into the country. Yeah. Because, yeah, oh, well. There you go. Well, they're gonna they're gonna lock it down again. What? So this is what you do when you're in a small island country like that, and you've only got a couple of cases. Is you contract trace the crap out of them. You can put all your resources on contact tracing those two or three cases. Figure out who they met. Isolate everybody. You just have to do micro martial law for those people, and um, and make them. Uh, uh, isolate themselves for two weeks, and then you can pretty much uh, knock this thing out of the out of your uh, uh, wheelhouse, and then uh, go back to having fun again. So good, good for them, though. This will be a lot easier for them. For us, absolutely. When you have four million ca- total cases and however many active cases, let's say it's half that or a, even a quarter of that, it's really hard to contract to contact trace that many people. Mm-hmm. So we would have limited resources trying to contact trace an overwhelming number of people, whereas they have overwhelming number of people that can contact trace a small number. So they should be able to beat this pretty quickly. And then on the Today Show, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> you in the Today I mean, Show. Yeah, well, I mean, you pick one, right, yep. and you stick with it. That's right. So if you use e-cigs and conventional cigarettes in the last 30 days— you are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID. If you vape, you are five times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID. What in the hell is that about? Part of what they said was, um, and, and it. Uh, They're more likely they to develop a, sim- symptoms. Well, they looked at a lot of young people and how people like to share their devices and uh, things like that. Well, stop doing that. Yeah, stop doing that. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, they're saying here, I'm looking at Stanford School of Medicine's uh, news website, not just a small increase in risk that young people may believe their age protects them from contracting the virus, that they will not experience symptoms of COVID-19. But the data show this isn't true among those who vape. The study tells us pretty clearly that youth are using vapes or are dual using, i.e. cigarettes and e-cigarettes, or elevated risk, it's not just a small increase in risk, it's a big one. So let's look how they did this. Um, they collected data via online surveys, so not the greatest data. And they were completed by 4,351 participants aged 13 to 24. If our kids, if I found them vaping, I'd there would be a problem. Military school. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. The researchers recruited a sample of participants that were evenly divided between those who had used e-cigs and those who had never used nicotine products. Also included approximately equal number of people in, in different age groups. And they answered questions about whether they had ever used a vaping device as well as whether they had vaped or smoked the last 30 days. Then they were asked if they had experienced COVID-19 symptoms, received a test for COVID-19, or received a positive diagnosis. Now, what were the symptoms they asked for? Because if you're smoking, you're more likely to be coughing. And if they counted that, then that then I cry BS on that. Okay, well, okay, it says results were adjusted for confounding factors such as age, sex, LGBTQ status, race, ethnicity, mother's level of education, body mass index, compliance with shelter in place orders, rate of COVID diagnosis in the states. And st- okay, so. Uh, I, I would like to see the survey just to see if there is a chance that bias mm-hmm. could have crept in. But it could be that if you're vaping, you're less likely to develop asymptomatic COVID-19, that you're going to end up having symptoms because you already have some inflammation in your exactly. lungs. That would be my guess. And um, the d- Today Show is not big on giving limitations of studies that they yeah, of course. talk about. Yeah. So, uh, it, I would, so that would be a hypothesis. And it would be testable that if you vape, you're less likely you're you have the same chances of getting it as anybody else, but you're less likely to develop asymptomatic. And so you could do that with a nice prospective cohort of of teenagers and you follow them over time 
and uh, doing antibody tests and continually testing them and see. And if the number of people that actually get it, let's say it's both groups have 15 percent of the groups get SARS-CoV-2 infections. But in this vaping group, only 5 percent of them were asymptomatic. And in the other group, the 99 percent were asymptomatic. That's then that's your answer. That's how you would have to test that okay. uh, that particular hypothesis. Another um, article that I found was on Facebook. So it's hey, hell yeah, guys, you know it's right. It's from the Washington Examiner, and um, they they did a poll um, which shows that Americans have a wildly o- overstated view of COVID nineteen's impact with respect to what's really going on. Okay, I don't know the Washington Examiner. I'd, I'm going to Google their political. Leaning and see, just for fun. Okay. I believe uh, it's right, but I may be okay, wrong. Okay, yeah. Widely described as conservative. Okay. okay. So th- that makes sense given this uh, this sort of... Well, and it comes from a source on Facebook that it does make sense. So okay. the poll question they asked was, how many people in your country have had COVID-19? Americans answered 20%, but in reality, it's 1%. Yeah. Right, that's right. So another question. So they were overstating asked, the severity of yes. the disease. Okay, gotcha. How many people in your country have died from it? Mm-hmm. Americans answered 9%. Reality is 0.04%. Right. So are we blowing all of this out of proportion? Uh, yes and no. Here's the thing. That 1% is still bad. Yeah. You know, if you have 350 million people, then you're looking at 3.5 million people. That's a lot of people. So 1% is still bad. If we had 1% of people who got this virus die, right, and 60 million people get it, then you're looking at, what? well, let me see, 1% would be 600 million people, or no, 600,000 wow. people, 600,000 mm-hmm. people dead, right? So, um, so it's a lot, a lot of people. So even though the percentage is small. The absolute numbers are still mind-bogglingly large. So the original poster's point was, why are we restricting? That's why. That's why, okay. because 1 percent. So, yes, because of, I think, their media coverage and general fear and anxiety, people are amplifying the numbers. Because people are generally bad at statistics, but they're also bad the other way, where you go, well, it's only 1%. Well, it's only not only 1%. Yes, 99% of people uh, who get this won't die. But the fact that 1% will, if we allowed this to just run out freely, because you know, people who get influenza will be, you know, 30 to 60 million a year will get influenza. So, uh, and that's only, you know, yeah, only... One fifth of the population, right? Mm-hmm. So that means four fifths aren't getting it. Yeah. But still, influenza is nothing to be laughed about. And then we're talking about something that is maybe ten times more deadly because the the mortality rate for influenza is about point one percent usually. Uh, there are certain strains that can be much higher than that, but on general, so this is even if this is as low as one percent case mortality. It's 10 times worse than influenza. So um, we're talking about 10 times more hospitalizations, 10 times more more uh, people dying. Over so that's stressing why. the health community. That's why. Yes. So I mean, we're I, I can't say a lot about it, but um, in our general area where where we are, the hospital beds that are designated for coronavirus patients is dwindling. It's not, you know, they're not gone. But I've watched that number march down. Now, I've also seen the number of cases start to drop again. And so we should see as the cases drop, overall, the hospitalizations will lag by about two weeks. Then you'll see the hospitalizations dropping. But the number of people in the hospital, some of those people are in the hospital for up to 50 days. Mm -hmm. So that takes a long time. It takes a couple of months before you can totally clear the hospitals out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. So 
Anyway, that's all I have. That's all you have? Okay, good. Those were good, Tace. Well, we have a bunch of regular medical questions out there, so good. you want to answer some? No, Number one thing, don't take advice from some asshole on the radio. It's your buddy uh, Ron Bennington, Tace. So let's see what we've got here. And, and he know Ron, it, he never says anything uh, incorrect, in my opinion, anyway. And the funniest thing and the most profound thing he ever said was, and we were talking about that this week, and he says, I don't see color. I only see things in black it's and white. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the, the funniest thing I think he's ever said. <laughs> All right. Today's episode is brought to you by Angie. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs and projects done well. Let me tell you, there's the version of it where you try to do something at home, and then there's a version of it where you have someone help you, you watch them do it the right way, and you go, thank God I didn't try to do that myself. I have fully done things around the home that I think look good, and then a bang in the night, and I wake up to a shelf collapsing, a painting falling off the wall. Like it, I've, I've seen it all go south. I own a home, and I can tell you... I know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Whatever your home project, big or small, indoor or outdoor, you can Angie that and connect with skilled professionals to get the project done well. Right now, one of my wish lists is I want a bike for my condo in Milwaukee and I would love to rig it up on a pulley in the ceiling because I have one of those like lofted ceilings, but I'm so scared to try that on my own. Angie has 20 years of home experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Here we go. Casey, can I talk to your husband? Hey, I was listening to the Bennington show. It's one of those once every show. Well, speaking of Bennington and speaking of Stacy Deloach, everybody, here's the problem with Stacy, and it's not really a problem. I have to play his calls. He's got like three of them this week, but they're all stellar calls. Ones that I actually, you know, I pick them based on ones that I want to answer. And uh, they're all good calls. So anyway, uh, you're going to get a Stacy Deloach uh, day today. Oh, no, they were Sorry. talking to Fez Watley. Fezzy was complaining about his cardiologist wearing a Ohio State mask. And they got to thinking, you hear people leaving, quitting doctors because of personality conflicts or different reasons all the time, They're complaining about their medical care professionals. Is it ethically okay for a doctor to stop seeing a patient because of a personality conflict. I've always wondered about that. Thank you. Bye, Tacey. <laughs> <laughs> Maniac. Um, so the answer is not really. Uh, just my responsibility is to my patient. And if we don't get along, I need to try to do what I can to get that, to forge a functional doctor patient relationship. Now, if we can't truly get along, then that's going to be impossible. They're not going to have – it's because they don't have confidence in me or there's some other – there's a conflict there that is impeding my ability to care for them. I can't just fire them, fire them, but I can say, look, I don't think this is working. I, I really think that – you know, this might be better for you if you found another provider and I'll be happy to care for you for the next 30 days. But um, and in a situation like that, I don't see why they wouldn't agree. But if they said, oh, hell no, I want to stay here. Well, that's like we got to work together to figure out a way that we can communicate uh, so that so that you're not getting angry at me or that we can get things done. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, if the patient is a danger to the community, I can fire them That's or dismiss them from my practice. That's usually because they're diverting their drugs or they're selling them or something like that. And if they're non-adherent, you can do it for that. You know, someone that just is killing themselves despite all of the things that you've tried to do, you can, although... I think that just because they don't do what you tell them to do, that's not a reason to to get rid of, you know, to dismiss somebody from your practice. I think that's actually unethical. But, you know, ethics isn't calculus. 
So um, it, our, what we're commanded to do is to do no harm and to have beneficence. In other words, do good. So we're supposed to do good and also do no harm. And um, if you can do both of those things, even though you got a patient you don't particularly like very much, then no, you, can, you can't really fire them for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. If you've done a good job, and that means you've done a good job, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good. All right. And some people you just can't get along with. Yeah. And most of the time they'll drift yep. away on their own. You know, they'll just find somebody else. But uh, you have to do your best to take care of your patients at all times. I have a silly question for you. Oh, well, this here you go. Stacy DeLoge, everybody. Not official reporter. Coughing CPR. Yes. I know it's floated around the Internet for 20 years about if you think you are having a heart attack, can you cough, make yourself cough very hard, very vigorously to kind of up the pressure in your heart to keep oxygen supplied to your brain? Now, obviously, if you somebody's fallen over from a heart attack and they're unconscious, it won't do any good. Is there any truth to that, or is there any facts behind it? Like all things like this, there's some truth. You ever heard this one? No, that's a really good question. Yeah. So it's been going around. It's not a heart attack. It's an arrhythmia. So uh, if you had, if you were conscious and you were having an arrhythmia, it is possible that you could cough. You know how they tell you if you got somebody that's got um, uh, an arrhythmia and you're doing CPR and you can't shock them to do the chest thump? Mm -hmm. That actually can stimulate electrical activity in the heart and can cause it to, uh, to beat. So uh, if you had an arrhythmia, you could cough over and over again to an attempt to get enough blood flow to the brain. And it may even, um, it's not impossible if you did it exactly right, that you could terminate certain arrhythmias. So, um, uh, but cough CPR, which is what he's talking about, is um, where people, uh, a conscious, responsive person coughs forcefully and repetitively to maintain enough blood flow to the brain to remain conscious for a few seconds. This is from the American Heart Association. Until the arrhythmia is treated, blood flow is maintained by increased pressure in the chest that occurs during forceful coughs. This has been mislabeled cough CPR. It's not a form of traditional resuscitation. It's not taught in CPR courses because it's not useful in the pre-hospital setting because it really is only going to work for a couple of seconds. Yeah, exactly. Now, what I think is more interesting is we have successfully in the hospital, back, particularly back in the 80s before we had a lot of different medications, stopped certain arrhythmias, you know, uh, uh, abnormal rhythms of the heart using a type of coughing. And this is where you have someone do a Valsalva maneuver, which is where, like, you're taking a dump, right? <gasps> and you're pushing it out real hard. And you push, and you push, and you're increasing the intrathoracic pressure, right? The pressure inside the thorax, you're increasing it. And then you have the person release it explosively. So I will do it now for your amusement. <gasps> like that, okay? And when you do that, every once in a while, their arrhythmia will terminate. Okay. And uh, we, we also, this is this was goofy. There's a thing called the diving reflex, and you can terminate some arrhythmias that way as well. The diving reflex is this mammalian reflex that um, whales use when they go underwater and they go deep. It slows their heart down, right? So they don't, their heart will only beat like one or two times a minute when they're deep, deep, deep in the water, but they don't die from it because their whole metabolism slows down. And you can induce that in humans, too. Humans have a diving reflex. That may be why some people can survive, like, falling under the ice for 40 minutes. You know, it's usually kids okay. that do that because their body temperature will, will decrease fast enough. But anyway, so I um, let's say I heard about a case where an intern and their senior resident went in and saw someone that was sitting up but it had an arrhythmia and they were very stable said let's try a diving reflex so they took a bucket of uh, like a, a big basin filled it up with ice water had the guy hold his breath and then pushed his head into the ice water and had him hold it there as long as he could right 
And then when he came up, his arrhythmia went away. And they successfully used the diving reflex to um, uh, terminate this guy's arrhythmia without using any drugs. Now, how crazy is that? Now, I would not do that in a place where you have access to drugs and other equipment that will successfully stop an arrhythmia, but it is just sort of a uh, cool, maybe wilderness thing for you to do if you're out in the, if you're on alone. And on you, alone, our new favorite show. Oh my God, that show! That is the I've never been okay. So it, completely taking a left turn. So tense watching a reality show. But Alone Season 6, and now we're on Season 7, where they put people in the Arctic and just say, see you later. And the last one to survive gets wins. What about the guy who killed a moose yeah. and still ended up starving? Yep. I mean, no spoilers. We won't say what happened. He did okay. But, yeah, he was starving mm-hmm. because he was uh, only eating moose meat. And it uh, doesn't have any fat in it or carbohydrates. So he was on an ultra low carb diet and he wasn't getting enough nutrients out of that. He was getting enough calories, but not enough nutrients. And he kept losing weight and um, he was really going downhill. So it's really interesting. You have to get enough fat. And he finally caught a fish and it had all kinds of fat in it. But he was fighting two wolverines that were stealing his food. Stole all his stuff. But all he the killed, time. He, uh, spo- little spoiler alert, he killed one of them with a hatchet. Which I'm I'm going to allow because it he was it was that or be killed. I mean, the, nothing but badasses on this show. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. I I'm not a I would never publicly say that I watch any reality show, but alone. But we so do. We so do. Right, right. We do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> and uh, but alone, I can recommend. We gotta watch that one on Netflix too. Which one is that? The one where, um, if they have any sexual encounters, it takes down the amount of money they win. Oh yeah, yeah. I hope they just end up at zero and they're all just screwing. <laughs> yeah, we've got to <laughs> because watch because they that. have to. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I shouldn't have brought that up. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, doke. Let's see here. All right. Let's do this one. We've got a little bit of time left. Hey, Doc. This is Zach from Okie City. Um, love your show. You already have a great show, but I just wanted to say that uh, your wife has just added another level of greatness. Um, oh. Oh, wow. Hey, uh, you're very funny, and I hope that uh, Dr. Steve there can talk you into staying on after all of this corona. He did not over. listen to last week's um, show, obviously. So- <laughs> what? Why? Because it was so boring. It just went on and on yeah, and yeah. on. Well, this and one's on. better. I hope it is. We got to talk about alone. I mean, Thanks, guys. Thanks for the laughs. I appreciate it. Um, my first question is: How was your vacation? <laughs> um, you guys uh, talked a lot about going on it, and then you came back, and I didn't really hear anything about it. Did we not talk about our vacation? I don't know. We may not have. Uh, I'm, we only have a couple of minutes left, and he actually has a question. So if we don't okay. get to it, we'll it was great. We'll do it first next time. It was so great. COVID-19 vacation was awesome. Mm-hmm. We'd go to the beach. We didn't have to go, well, it's 4.30. We need to go to, you know, to back and get cleaned up because we got to get to the restaurant by 6. We just stayed out there until we felt like coming in. And then I cooked, or, you know, or, well, I'll mm-hmm. say we cooked. And uh, it was fantastic. It was so fantastic that I had decided I was going to work 10 more years. I'm not going to. That that vacation made me decide that when my youngest son, Beck, is, who has a better radio voice than me, by the way, when he uh, graduates from high school, I'm done. And we're going to retire. And that's three years from now. And it's the clock is ticking, Tase. Clock is ticking. And you're going to be stuck with that me. That means I get to quit, too, right? Yeah, of course. I'm not yeah. going to retire by myself. That sounds awesome. All right. But anyway, let's see what the rest of his question is. Let's see here. Uh oh. Uh oh. Show on faction, but uh, I didn't hear it on the podcast. So just wondered about that. My medical question, Doctor Steve, is um, I uh, suffer from chronic uh, acid reflux and heartburn. Um, I've been taking an over-the-counter uh, uh, acid reducer for a few years now, and I'm just wondering if um, scientists and doctors know. Uh, of any adverse effects of long-term use for for acid reducers. So uh, thanks again, guys. Love your show. 
Yeah, yeah, no, this is an excellent question. So I, I emailed him back, or I texted him back, and he, because there are different acid reducers, and he is using omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, which is really interesting because proton pump inhibitors inhibit protons, obviously, hence the name, but protons are quantum, they're quantum objects, right? It's a three quarks bound together, and it obeys quantum physics rules. And how in the hell natural systems figured out how to manipulate protons before humans even knew what protons were? We can barely manipulate them now. It is quite incredible when you think about it, hmm. you know. So protons, naked protons, are uh, hydrogen ions, which are, um, you know, that's where acid comes from. You've got uh, hydrogen uh, or uh, hydrochloric acid is hydrogen, which is positively charged, and chlorine, which is negatively charged. And that naked proton is what causes acidity. And um, so they have I'm, – I'm going to read from Mayo Clinic Proceedings because this is the definitive answer as far as I'm concerned. That PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, have had an encouraging safety profile. And then there were some recent studies regarding, well, let me stop paraphrasing. Let me just read what it says. Recent studies regarding the long-term use of PPI medications have noted potential adverse effects, including risk of factors, pneumonia, uh, Clostridium difficile, uh, diarrhea, which is an infectious diarrhea, causes pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, hypomagnesemia, which is low magnesium, vitamin B12 deficiency, chronic kidney disease, and dementia. These emerging data have led to subsequent investigations to assess these potential risks in patients receiving long-term PPI therapy. And However, most of the published evidence is inadequate to establish a definite association between PPI use and the risk for development of serious adverse effects. Hence, when clinically indicated... PPIs can be prescribed at the lowest effective dose for symptom control, and that would include long-term. So I'm on long-term PPI. I'm aware of these things. Um, I'm on the lowest effective dose right now. I've got myself down to 15 milligrams of um, Dexlan, Soprazole, or one of those. And, um, you know, it's doing very well, and I, the safety profile is adequate for me to feel com comfortable that I can take this long-term. And there isn't uh, as Mayo Clinic Proceedings is not a crummy journal. This is a journal of record for uh, uh, not only uh, thought leaders, but top researchers to publish in. So uh, I feel pretty good about that statement as far as PPIs are concerned. So talk to your provider. See if you're on the lowest effective dose. So a lot of people are on 60 milligrams of stuff or 30 milligrams of stuff that could maybe even get down to a lower dose, cut it in half uh, to, from 60 to 30. I went from 60 to 30 to 15. So, and I'm feeling pretty good. So there you go. All right. So anyway, um, I hope that answers your question. And uh, But all, as always, talk with your health care provider. Tace, it's been a delight being here with you today as always, and I uh, hope you'll be here forever now. Hmm. We can't forget Rob's... <laughs> that was an, not, a, not a... Oh, boy, Steve, I hope I can. Can I? <laughs> we can't forget Rob Sprantz, Bob Kelly, Greg Hughes. That's more, that was more like a... Well, that's interesting that you feel that way kind of answer. Bob Kelly, Greg Hughes, Anthony Kumia, Jim Norton, Travis Teff, Lewis Johnson, Paul Ofcharsky, Eric Nagel... Roland Campos, Sam Roberts, Pat Duffy, Dennis Falcone, Matt Kleinschmidt, Dale Dudley, the great Rob Bartlett, Ron Bennington, and Fez Watley, who supported this show, has never gone unappreciated. Listen to our SiriusXM show on the Faction Talk channel, Sirius Channel 103, Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern, on demand, and other times at Jim McClure's pleasure. Uh, a big shout out to my niece Holly who enjoyed her shout out the other day many thanks to our listeners whose voicemail and topic ideas make this job very easy uh, shout out to Martha from Arkansas uh, go to our website at drsteve.com for schedules and podcasts and other crap until next time check your stupid nuts for lumps quit smoking get off your asses and get some exercise we'll see you in one week for the next edition of Weird Medicine thanks Tyson. 
Thank you.